Darren Ferrigia, man, thank you so, so much for taking some time today to chat with me. You are without a doubt, you know, someone who I look up to so much in terms of just being not only an amazing drummer, but like how you've been able to, you know, have such a successful, varied, versatile career um, as a drummer in the Australian music scene. Um, yeah, it's you're, you're someone who I... It really inspires me and, and, and I idolize so much. So, man, thank you very much for, for sitting down and chatting today. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. You are too kind. <laughs> oh, man, no, not at all. I mean, for anyone who doesn't know Darren uh, out there, um, just, yeah, like I said, an absolute legend of the Australian drumming music scene. Um, going through your bio quickly and just pulling out <laughs> some some names of the you know, many, many that you've played with, you know, Tom Jones, B.B. King, Bonnie Raitt, Tommy Emmanuel, Leo Sayer, Hugh Jackman. Like, it's amazing. And, and not to mention, like, all of the session work and TV work you've done in the past. So, yeah, go check out Darren stuff and your, your amazing solo projects as well, which is super, super cool. So, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's great. You've got such a wealth of experience and knowledge in so many different uh, avenues of, of playing as well as the scene itself. So, um, yeah, man, I, I, I feel like we could talk about so many different things. Um, but, uh, but I, I want to start by, um, talking about a little thing that I, I think about a lot when I think of you. And that's when we actually got to play together for a little while with a uh, band called Goose, which, yeah. uh, unfortunately doesn't play that much anymore. But apart from my dad, you were one of the first drummers that I played with, um, not uh, like as a drummer but I was playing percussion in the band and you were playing drums at that time and for any drummers out there who have had the chance or might have the chance to play in a band with another drummer uh, I would really highly suggest it because you learn so much and you hear the drums in a completely different way when you're in the band um, but not on the drum chair and not from the audience perspective either so um, I just remember like playing with you and thinking oh man this this is the level of confidence and and authority over like time and feel and effortlessness that I want to have as a drummer and and yeah getting to 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 stand next to you and play percussion and and, and watch you lead a band like that from the drum chair was really really inspiring and I, I I still think about those those times a lot so yeah it was really fun man to, to do that <laughs> but um well, yeah you know, I, had I have known had I have known back then the monster the monster drummer that you are i i, I probably wouldn't have um, felt so confident about being ah. on stage with you <laughs> oh man too kind no it's it's it, i mean those memories that like i said they they have really like helped to shape my journey and and my path and and um yeah so yeah it's it's great to talk with you in this state now where we're kind of reflecting on that stuff as well as um you know i've got so many questions i i, I want to ask you um but firstly I, I guess like i said um you are extremely versatile as a player um musically um uh, looking at what you're doing now uh, and obviously the stuff, you know, even going back to Hey Hey days where you were playing with different artists and, and musicians all the time. Uh, that versatility, was that always like a, a focus for you? Like, did you always want to be a versatile drummer, being able to say yes to everything? Or did you kind of start in one lane, like uh, jazz or rock, and then kind of, you know, the, div the diversity came out of necessity? Um, <clears throat> it's a bit of, bit of both. I think ultimately, you know, the influence behind wanting to be a versatile drummer is just the fact that I wanted to work, you know, I, and, and I recognise this in my mid-teens, you know, when I was starting to make decisions about wanting to be a full-time drummer, I knew that the more I knew, the more I would work. And have, at, at the same time, you know, a lot of the, I'll say, you know, my biggest influence, you know, still to this day and as was back in in my mid-teens with Steve Gadd. And, you know, I had a lot of records that he played on. And so he was playing on everything from, you know, the pop music of the day to playing, you know, records by, you know, Chick Corea or Lee Rittenour or, or whoever. He was just on, he just seemed to be on everything. And, and he played, he played quite a lot of styles. And I also liked the way he, he I liked his Latin grooves. And I love the fact that he had this beautiful snare drum technique. So really it was, that was a big influence trying to emulate that, trying to 
you know, sort of make these categories of musical styles that I felt that I could sort of get into and learn that would ensure that I, I would have some kind of, um, you know, not only a place in the music scene, but also some longevity in the music scene as well. So, it, it, and then and then local drummers, you know, again, you know, I was into David Jones and Virgil Donati, and those guys were doing studio sessions and doing jazz gigs and, you know, whatever. So I think I think I just accepted that that should actually be a part of, you know, you know, being a being a working drummer. For sure, for sure. That's yeah, that's super interesting because uh, obviously there are, there are guys out there who you know are specialists in in a certain uh, style or uh, genre or whatever, and and they obviously are are amazing. Uh, but from like yeah, that working drummer, you know being able to play as your like primary source of income so to speak and like uh that balance has always been an interesting one to me and how and people's you know perspective on that um so yeah i think f for me as well like i um i i looked at my dad who was a freelance drummer and he kind of made his career just playing drums and and playing music which yeah i recognize as well that you just need to be able to say yes to everything if you want to be able to like i guess make money just as as a playing uh player but um nowadays like do you how important do you think it is to like diversify your skill set as a musician um if you want to have a, a successful career like i mean in terms of even just like like yourself like being able to record from home or being able to compose or being able to arrange or, or obviously teach like do, do you think that's an important thing in today's scene like, or yeah I, I think it is i mean I, it just depends on how involved you want to be in a scene um you know, I've I've done my best to keep up with things. You know, I've done my best to, you know, like I, I my career could well have been over when Hey Hate hey, Saturday finished, you know, and and I gotta I've got to say a really funny thing. Hey Hate hey, Saturday finished um about a month before my first child was being was about to be born, right? So and then I knew I had to take gigs because you know we were down to one income. And my first gig that I did back was uh, my first couple of gigs were with um, <laughs> a Maltese wedding band, which is where I got my start as a teenager, you know, or, you know, I did my first gigs because my, my family are Maltese. So my, my first gigs were playing in a Maltese reception band and to have, you know, nine years of high profile television work come to an end right before my son was born and then go back to what I was doing as a 12 and 13 year old was, it was, it was kind of um, quite a reality check. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I made a point to, you know, like take on more students and all of that sort of stuff. So fast forwarding to, you know, the present day, things are different, you know, like there are no more clinics. There are no, we don't do clinics anymore. I used to do a lot of clinics and, you know, the, the, the studio scene doesn't really exist anymore. So, you know, what do I do in order to satisfy those particular urges um, that don't exist outside of this room? So, you know, that's when I got into doing the YouTube thing and that's when I set up a studio so I could record tracks for people at home. And, um, you know, I, I tried to, it, it, as, as um, self-absorbed as this may sound, there is a certain amount of relevance that you have to, or that one has to have in a scene. And I, I, know, I know people who, for example, you know, you know, they're, they're not into social media, so they don't have, they don't have, uh, you know, they don't have a Facebook account or they don't have um, Instagram or they don't do any of that stuff. But, but then they, they're also sort of scratching their heads as to why they're not working as much as they would like. And, and it's not because you necessarily need those things to work, but there's a certain thing where you need to just be relevant and you need to. Uh, allow people to, uh, to to know that, you know, you exist somewhere. And um, if you put up a video of yourself, you know, playing at a gig or whatever, people go, oh yeah, that's that guy. And, um, you know, you're just kind of there somewhere. And and, and so that's that's important to me. That, that has always been important to me. Mm, man, there's so much in that that's uh, that, that I find super interesting. Firstly, like, super humbling to hear that story about like you 
doing the Hey Hey gig and then going back to like the, you know, your teenage uh, band days. Because I think there's like, I mean, it's probably always existed, but there's a lot of pressure and and thought behind, you know, as a musician, as a drummer, as, as whatever, you're constantly trying to like do the next best thing and then the next best thing, next best thing. And you see these guys doing these massive shows and you think like, oh man, they're just like living the absolute dream. But the reality is sometimes like someone might be out on tour with a huge name artist and then they come back to their hometown and they're back doing the, yeah, the bar gigs and the, the club gigs and the weddings and, and that's totally okay. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, totally it is, fun. It is absolutely totally okay. I mean, yeah. um, <clears throat> you know, as I've gotten older, there's one thing I really love doing is when someone offers me a gig and it's out in the country you know, where I have to drive maybe a couple of hours and, and do a gig in a country town. And I really like that. And often I will just say yes to those gigs just so I can get out of the city. And right. I did you know, I did one uh, a week or so back in, in Ballarat on a Tuesday night doing this cabaret style gig, which was sold out. And it was fun. It was fun. I enjoyed the experience of just getting out in the country, listening to an audio book in the car on the way there. So, you know, th- and, and there's something that's so much better about that than, you know, being on a stage and, you know, in front of a big audience and dealing with pressure, you know, it's nice to actually not have pressure. I mean, pressure is great because it makes you play a certain way if you've got the confidence to um, meet it head on. But, you know, there's just times when you want to do something simple. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure, man. That's, that's super, super cool. Um, uh, something else you, you mentioned just before was about how you, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about establishing your YouTube presence and, and how that kind of evolved and, and uh, you know, what you thought was, you know, uh, you wanted to share and the angle you wanted to take with it. Um, but I, I think, yeah, there is a bit of a taboo thing and it's not just like, you know, it's not a, a certain type of person or, or generation or whatever but there are certainly like stigmas behind uh social media and a lot of people kind of categorize it into this thing of being like yeah vain and and kind of you know not unnecessary and all that kind of stuff but i think i i really agree with you in a sense of like if you if you want to be known now and seen and recognized like it is a reality and it's in it's an important factor in in the scene today just to to have some kind of presence i think what whatever it might be even if it is just like yeah throwing a little clip up if you're playing or practicing or doing something it's just like you know reminding people because otherwise it's just you just like can get lost if if it is if you do want to play and you do want to be out there like it is it is a thing that's really important yeah well um the the, the you know my my start in the youtube world was really a lot of encouragement from my partner and she, she kept saying to me, you've got to do it. You have so much to offer. And, and me, I was just reluctant because the learning curve when it came to, you know, learning editing software and learning how to set up cameras and lights and all of that stuff was just a bit too overwhelming for me at the time. And then, so I, I caved in and I, I did my first video. And then immediately after I did that video, I got, uh, some I got a comment from somebody on someone contacted me on Facebook and said that they saw the video and they've got this um this Facebook page for drummers and they've created a challenge where people have to learn the con the the particular thing that I was covering in that in that video and I thought wow this is cool I've immediately connected with people and so um you know that 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 first experience was quite encouraging. And so I, I, I sort of kept going from there and, and sort of made a commitment to doing a, a video every week. And then I started, or at least uploading a video every week. And then, um, you know, I started setting goals for myself by, you know, this particular time I want this amount of subscribers and all of that. And then I set up um, the, the store, you know, where people can download PDFs. And, 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 you know, I thought about this in the long term, like in just in terms of, creating some passive income in, in the longer term. You know, as I'm getting older, I, 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 I'm getting very particular about the kind of work that I want to do. So I'm not going to go out and do everything. So, you know, in the future, I want to be able to just have money being able to come into my bank account without actually having to physically leave the house or lug a set of drums in order to do that. Um, yeah. So that, that's really how that came about. Um, it's funny because there is, you know, like you said, there are stigmas associated with that kind of thing. For me, 
um, you know, there there are a lot of drummers doing this sort of thing. I, like I'm one of, you know, tens or possibly hundreds of thousands of drummers doing, you know, this, this kind of YouTube thing. And so um, a lot of those drummers probably don't play as much as I do. You know, there are guys who only do that. They only just do YouTube, which is great. You know, they have a lot to offer in that sense. But I still consider myself a working drummer. You know, I, I'm still doing several gigs a week. And um, so every so often I like to put up a video of a gig or put up a video of me, you know, not that it happens that often, but whenever I'm in a recording studio doing a session, I will, you know, upload some footage from that as well. And then, you know, the other thing that we need to consider too in this day and age is, you know, back, I can't, I don't know how old you are now, Ben, but back, back in the 90s or let's say pre-internet, the only information we got about drummers was, you know, buying Modern Drummer magazine. You know, we couldn't go on YouTube. We we had no idea of what was going on essentially outside of the US. And and now with the advent of, you know, the of YouTube and and whatever uh, other social media platforms, I'm I'm now aware of drummers that just exist all over the globe. And that's the difference. When I was doing Hey Hey It's Saturday, you know, that was a a very popular television show, but it was really confined to, you know, within Australia and, and, and at one point New Zealand for a little while, but that was it. All these years later, I don't have the high profile gig that I used to have um, in, in the term, in terms of the television gig. But what I do have is an international audience of drummers who, who follow me, who support me by buying my products and who comment on on my videos and you know that's the thing that i'm so overwhelmed by is just the the reach you know I, I even had like i get guys commenting from all over the world every week and it's 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 very humbling but there was one time where this guy sent me a message to tell me he enjoyed my videos or whatever he was in the ukraine you know and so i i said to him when i re responded to his his comment i said you know i hope you're doing okay there and he said, well, you know, we're getting bombed and all of that sort of stuff. But, you know, I still come back to watching videos and playing the drums because it makes me feel good. And I'm thinking, man, you know, like I've I've just had this interaction with a guy who's in a in a war zone. You know, his country is getting bombed and he's taken the time out to comment on a video that I made. You know, and that mm. that's what that's what keeps me going in that in that regard. Gosh, wow. That's super powerful, man. Amazing. Um, uh, but it's it's a testament to the quality of what you present as well because like you say there there are a lot of guys that are doing this but like not everyone certainly not everyone has the experience that you do and is still out there actually playing and being able to share information that you use every day <laughs> as a drummer you know um so that's really valuable and i think something that like resonated with me when i started thinking about setting up the the this kind of youtube uh, platform is that although there are so many people out there sharing information and doing this kind of thing it's just sometimes the way that you present the information you know you could be saying the same thing as someone else as someone's been saying for you know 10 20 years but it's you know everyone has their own unique voice and it's the way it's phrased and presented and delivered from you know your perspective that you know is going to resonate with someone um even if it is the same so that's yeah that's something that i i think is is, is important to remember for, for, for me, but also like you have, um, like I said, so much to share, which is just like, it, it's it's super valuable for the drumming community as a whole to, to have an, the incredible resource that you that you uh, offer. So yeah, man, thank you for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Again, thanks for more, more encouragement and more support. No, it's cool. great, man, it's great. Um, so yeah, something else I wanted to talk to you about, um, was uh, you, you subbed on a uh, Cat Empire tour recently and, and some shows for them, right? Yeah, that was awesome. That was yeah. um, that was in March. We we did a five week tour of Europe. Amazing, man! I I think like just when, when I see when I saw that you you were gonna do that, I thought, yeah, absolutely, like the perfect guy to to come in to that gig. Uh, both musically and in terms of like being a sub drummer, because I know how versatile you are and how you can, uh, you know, adapt, but also bring your own unique voice to, to something. But um, that band for me was like, so uh, like a, 
influential and inspiring when I was in high school. You know, the music was like the soundtrack of me and my friends, you know, high school time. <laughs> so like I often thought about like subbing for them and what that would be like. And, oh man, that would be so cool to do this and play this song and be in this festival environment and all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm curious for you, would, like how did that play out in terms of like, um, uh, like your approach to it and like what the dialogue was like between you and, and Danny and the band in terms of how, how you were going to play, if there was there much direction in that, or was it just kind of like learn these recordings and then we'll see how it goes. Or- um, that, that's funny. Well, firstly, I should talk about just going back a little bit before that, the way I got the gig, because that, you know, that was one gig that I never thought I would ever get asked to do. Like I it just, it was never in my radar. And in, in fact, at that, at the point that I was asked, I was not aware that the band had reformed because the band had officially, you know, did their final tour and that was the end of the band. So um, I put a band together of my own, finally, you know, playing in a band, um, p- performing all of my own compositions. And the trumpet player in that band is Ross Irwin. And so we did a gig, um, a first gig. It was great. It was sold out. Everything was fantastic. And about three days later, I remember where I was. Exa- I was at Newcastle Airport waiting to fly home from a gig. And I get a phone call from Ross Irwin and me thinking that he was just ringing up to talk about the gig that we'd just done. And so I was having a chat with him and saying, oh, yeah, blah, blah, blah. You know, yeah, the gig was great. Thanks a lot for doing it. I'll get paid. So, you know, all of that usual post gig <laughs> stuff. And he said, actually, that's not the reason why I'm calling. I'm just calling you up to find out if you were if you would be interested in doing a European tour with the Cat Empire. And I just could not believe it. Um and so I said yes straight away, and he said no, no. Let me give you the details, and and, <laughs> and, and, I, and I and I like I just the, I blocked the conversation out beyond that point because I just wanted yeah. to do the gig. Yeah. Um, and then you know he sent me the details, and also it sounded great. You know, like I thought this is going to be fun. This is going to be mm-hmm. fun. I've never done anything like this before. So what happened was um, that gig wasn't till March of this year. So I got the phone call in August of last year, and what happened was in December. And so I kind of put it out of my mind. I didn't want to get too hyped up about it just in case the thing fell through. And what happened in December was um, they were recording to do some shows or a show in uh, Tas- Tasmania somewhere. And anyway, I got a phone call to say, Hey, um, Danny can't make a couple of days of rehearsals. Do you want to come in and rehearse with us? And we'll give you an opportunity to learn the songs. And I thought, yeah, that'd be great. So I had about maybe a couple of weeks notice. And and so this is in December. And so I had to learn, I learned, you know, I just wrote out, you know, charts for about 15 songs in a day, you know, just spent the whole day doing it. And I said, look, you know, I can do this, just be aware that I'm going to be reading at the rehearsal. And I said, that's totally fine. And anyway, so, you know, I went in, actually, I went into the studio where they were rehearsing maybe a on their first day of rehearsal. So I could hear Danny. I asked if I can go in and I, I, I was there for about an hour or so and just heard Danny play the rehearsal and get an idea of how, how Danny played the show. So that was a, a big help to me. So then when it came for me to do two days of rehearsals with them, um, you know, I was, I knew the tempos of the songs I'd listened to the, they asked me to listen to the original recordings of the songs and not the live versions. Mm. So, um, you know, I I did that and, you know, much to my surprise, they were really happy with how I approached it. You know, they, they just thought I, uh, I fit in, you know, like you said earlier, um, you, you know, they, they said what, what you said that, the, you know, they, I just seemed like the obvious choice to them, but I didn't feel that, you know, I didn't mm. feel like I, I didn't, I never thought in a million years I'd get asked to do that gig. Mm. Um, so, you know, the dialogue, you know, they're, they're, they're amazing because they said, you know, more than one person in that band said, you know, the idea is, you know, you go in and you play the gig, but, you know, inject your thing into it too, you know, your energy, your vibe and all of that. And, you know, there, there wasn't, you know, there wasn't any time that I can recall during that tour or during the re- rehearsals where they they were at me about the way I was playing. Uh, you know, they just seemed to think that I was a really good fit. So, you know, that was massively encouraging. It was it was just the most wonderful experience. That's incredible, man. So, so cool. Because I, I heard a few, uh, like, live clips and things um, of you playing with the band and, and yeah, how you approached it. And, it, man, it's just, yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was just, like, because it, it, it sounded like you, you know, obviously, like, your... your um, 
uh, yeah, your style and your vibe and, and all that kind of thing, but within that context and framework of, of their music. So yeah, it's, it was super cool. But yeah, man, I just found that really, um, that kind of journey is always kind of a little bit interesting. I think too, when, a, you know, someone is asked to come and sub for a big band like that. Um, and I guess like, uh, you know, they're like reestablishing their sound and, and their personnel a little bit now. So, uh, I, I thought it was interesting too, like having you come in at that early age and whether that's kind of, um, yeah, how that's affected, you know, uh, even Danny's approach, maybe like, have, have, did you offer things that have kind of been added in or is it still just like Danny's taking it back and, and, uh, he's, he's running with it now. I, I, I would imagine Danny's running with it now. Um, having said that, you know, with the reformation of the band, um, up until the point that I finished that tour, I, I had done more gigs with that band, with that inception of the band that Danny. So I guess, um, some things had changed while I was doing it. You know, they added sections to songs or they might say, let's add another 16 bars here, or let's change the groove here, or let's open up this section. So, a lot of those things evolved actually on tour. And that was the thing that really knocks me out about this band is that, you know, we might change the set from night to night. We might add songs or we might change the order of the songs. They're constantly tweaking things. And then, you know, at the start of every sound check, um, you know, Ross will have taken notes about things that might have gone astray during the gig. And he might say, oh, when we get to this bit, let's just, you know, focus on tightening up you know, what, whatever, or, you know, it was just, it was mm. like this band has take a lot of care and pride in what they do. And, and the attention to detail, you know, is really good too. So I know every gig was, it was so important to me. It was, I, I never once became complacent and thought, yeah, this is great. I've got this nailed now. Like I just wanted to give it a hundred percent. And, and, you know, every gig was different, but there were some nights that were just really special. Like, you know, the, the show that we did in London was probably, my favorite one um in that you know i lived in london for a few years and i had friends there and and um you know that that was really special to me i had ex students there and then you know the show in paris was great because you know it's a big city i love paris um and my partner had come over from you know melbourne and she was traveling and we met up in paris for you know 24 hours and you know so you know the, there were those things and, and 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 when when you have those particular moments you actually put in even more than you would at any other gig absolutely it was, it, was, it was great for me like i i i'm just so grateful for the opportunity cool man that's awesome to hear so so great man uh, yeah again very inspiring to to hear uh, that journey and progression and and that they are like you know great guys because I, I mean i know a lot of those guys already and know that they're like super awesome dudes <laughs> musically so I, yeah. I yeah i don't don't expect anything less in that sense but yeah it's it's cool to hear your experience with all that as well actually i was that kind of leads me into something I, I also wanted to ask you about and that was yeah you'd spent like quite a bit of time living and working in london right like a five or six years or something like that i was there for about four and a half years okay cool yeah so just um, after we were playing in goose i left ah okay right right made the move so you just yeah okay cool w what um i guess like there's a there's a lot of guys out there who you know think about going through the the path of music school and university and then their local scene and then it's like okay what now you know if they do want to um go on to to different things and making that move to a, a new city, whether it's a London or a New York or an LA or things like that. Um, wh what was that experience like for you? And then I guess like, cause you lived, lived in Australia, then lived and worked in London and then have come back to Australia. W were there any like uh, particular differences that you found interesting or do you think one, you know, city can learn from the other in, in like the, the, the scene sense? Or? Um yeah that's interesting my experience in all of that was was interesting because by the time i'd moved to london um i i had melbourneian friends and musicians who had moved there and were doing gigs so i moved there and got gigs straight away you know right. i was but you know i was working with people who knew me i was working with people who um you know, who I had worked with here in Melbourne. So I remember when I got my first gig with um, 
you know, working with musicians that I didn't know that that was when I was, I got really nervous and, you know, any sort of sense of complacency was completely gone by that point. And I, I had to treat each gig like it was my first. So that was tough, you know, for the first couple of gigs, getting used to that idea. But what I found was amazing was, you know, the amount of amount of times that my name got um, tossed around. And so I was getting phone calls for, for gigs all the time. It was really great, you know, and I, and just, it, it just got better and better. Um, to the point where, you know, I was doing gigs at Ronnie Scott's. I remember there was one particular experience where I was playing in Carl Orr's band and we had three nights at Ronnie Scott's supporting the Yellow Jackets, you know, so we'd do a set, the Yellow Jackets would do a set, we'd do a set, the Yellow Jackets would do a set, then the same thing would happen uh, the following night. So, you know, we're playing to audiences that really appreciate that sort of music and the band that we were playing in, you know, Carl's band was, it was just great, you know, playing Carl's, fusion tunes and all of that sort of stuff so you know that that was great and then um I got hounded for a long time to come in as a dep on a West End show mm-hmm. called Thriller which was this Michael Jackson show and I kept putting it off but then by the by the my last year in London you know the global financial crisis had really kicked in and and you know like I, I needed work so I decided to um <laughs> accept accept the gig and then you know, I went into that gig and, you know, I thought, wow, I'm actually playing a West End show, man. I can't believe this. Mm-hmm. And, and so I did that as a dip. And then that that show, and actually while I was doing that show, during the time that I was doing it as a sub, Michael Jackson had actually died. Wow. And, and Michael Jackson was booked to do 21 shows at the O2 Arena. So, you know, that's well over a million people that were going to go and see him. So they all got their money refunded and they came to see Thriller, the show in, in the West End. So the shows were full and packed and people going nuts. And, yeah, we play a song and people are screaming out, you know, I love you, Michael, and all this sort of stuff. It was oh quite an goodness. emotional experience. So um, so because of the popularity of that, um, we, you know, they split the show up so that, you know, because there was so many cast and so many musicians that they were actually able to have a touring version of that show as well. So I jumped on the tour and I toured with that for about a month um you know going to you know eastern europe so again seeing all of these places that i would never have seen um had i've not been doing that show and had not have been a musician so um you know that that was great and then i came back and it was actually i've got to say this is going to sound like a shock to a lot of people i was harder breaking into the melbourne scene I thought, wow. yeah, I'll just go in there and I'll, you know, I sent I sent some emails out to people to try and get a teaching gig and and um, coming home was hard. You know, it was wow. really hard. It took it took a long time, but you know, before things, it was it was easy for me to get gigs in London than it was to get gigs back here. And I thought, that's you incredible. Yes, yeah. <laughs> it was awful. And you know, like even like it'd be four years after I'd moved back, and people would say, oh, "Are you still living in London? Are you be out here visiting." Mm-hmm. It, wow, it was, man. It was very funny. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure because you obviously were like extremely established before moving. And then uh, you would kind of think in some ways like coming back, you'd you'd be, you know, as busy, if not more busy, you know, in a short period of time. Um, but not just uh, not not for it to take certainly that long. So, wow, it's, that's that's a really interesting thing to, to hear. Um, what so you you got you moved to london and you already had some contacts there so yeah how how like what advice would you give to someone who was considering moving to a place like london or or anywhere really who who where they don't really know people is it best to just go there and you know get out and see gigs and and that do that kind of thing or try and reach out to people before or um there's a few ways i guess you could do it i, I made a point of um, having um, a teaching gig just so that while I'm waiting for the gigs, to, the playing gigs to pick up, you know, I had some students or I had a class or whatever to teach. Mm. And that was really helpful to me. So prior to moving to London, I was in London maybe a month or two months before that. And that's when I went to a school and set up an interview as to get try and get a teaching job. And they offered me a job straight away, fortunately. Um and so um you know that helped so a, a friend of mine who um who i worked with here who's now living in london um you know she she's a great singer and she's 
you know, teaching at the school that I taught at. So, you know, that, that sort of helps. If you don't have any, if you don't have that kind of inclination and you just want to get out there and play and, you know, find a band, you know, they, they have jam sessions there um, and, you know, there's a bunch of gigs. So I think, you know, you just have to rely on some networking skills, mm. um, you know, make friends. Um, you know, I, I, I gave my number out to people. Every gig that I did, you know, if I was in a, if I, if I was, you know, playing in a five piece band, the other four members were potential um, employers of mine. So I always gave them my phone number and, mm -hmm. you know, I, and that was funny because I, I didn't, I never had to network, you know, mm. well, not for a long time, you know, not till I was not since I was a little kid, you know, not mm. little kid, but, you know, teenager trying to break into the scene. So, you know, I had to rely on those skills of saying, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm a drummer. I'm, you know, do this and here's my number. Let's have a play or let's, you know, you just got to do that. You just got to become a networker in a, in a polite way. Not no one, no one in England, certainly no one in Australia likes people who are in your face about it, you know, and, you know, mm. give me, do it, do that sort of stuff, but they, they, you can be really polite about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, it's just awesome to hear like you, you going at that stage, like I said, where you were very established in, in Melbourne and then, making that move to a different city like i think a lot of people wouldn't have the guts to do that you know like the 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 drive and the the you know confidence to be like no nah, i'm, I'm going to re-establish myself in a new place that's really uh inspiring to hear just in terms of like um uh, a career lifespan you know it's not like you have to be you know if you want to move you need to move before you know you're 21 or something like that like you you can kind of you know, if you want to do it, you can do it at any point. It just, you know, some things are harder, some things are easier because you're older and more experienced. But, you know, getting back into that, you know, mindset, like you say, of you know, networking again, uh, it, it can can be challenging. So, yeah, great, great to hear that, man. Yeah, well, I was 38 when I decided to do it. Yeah, wow. So, wow. you know, I was no spring chicken, let's say. <laughs> Yeah, no, but, but that's cool, man. That's super cool because, like I said, there's I think that that common path that sometimes people feel the pressure of is like, I got to figure it out, and do I want to move or not? And you know, but like you know, you're living proof that you can kind of do it whenever you like. It's just you know, <laughs> the coming back thing was was interesting to hear as well. <laughs> well, that, like, that's I, that's the thing I did not expect. I expected yeah. the, I expected it to be harder there than, and not hard here. Yeah, man, that's that's amazing. Um, okay. Well, man, this has been so, so cool. Um, I, I want to maybe wrap it up with just, um, talking a little bit about, well, hearing your thoughts on, uh, on, you know, the versatility thing and, and how much different work you're able, you're doing at the moment. Um, you know, for, for some younger guys out there or even guys that are like established in, in the scene, what, what do you think are the really important things or elements of playing or, or, you know, music business or whatever it might be that are, are important today, like in today's scene, what, what are the things that you think it will make you as a drummer or as a musician successful? Um, you know, I, I, it maybe took me a few years to sort of attain enough maturity to be able to say, put the music first, you know, like yeah. put your own ego aside and put the music first. And, you know, all I want from my career is to just keep playing the drums, you know, because a few years, I, a few years ago, I wanted to actually, you know, give it away and get out of the music business. So wow. um, I had a bit of a, you know, I don't know, something shifted. And, um, you know, I just, I just know that if, if you do all of those things that are important for the music, you know, for, for us drummers, you know, playing with great time, um, which is, you know, the thing that I struggle with the most, um, you know, playing the right fills, playing, um, you know, playing at the right tempo, just taking care of those things that, you know, I consider mm. part of our job, you know, just mm. all of those things. And then from the other side, you know, just being easy to get along with, having fun with people, you know, all of those things, you, you're setting yourself up for not only a career, but, you know, a long career. Um, you know, that's what I, that's what I try to tell you know, my, my students that, you know, just try and find whatever it is about that song that's challenging you, you know, like, even if you've got to go boom, but boom, for, you know, for a four minute song, mm. if that's boring to you, then you're completely missing the point. 
<laughs> you, totally. You, you know what I mean? Like, you, yeah. You, you, I, I've done. A, I did a video on this actually, um, a YouTube video where if you're playing a simple song that's you know made up of an intro, a verse, a pre-chorus, a chorus, a verse, a pre-chorus, a chorus, a solo, an out, uh, out. You know, there's each of those. Even if you've got to play one and three on the bass drum and two and four on the snare drum, there are subtle changes that you can make on the hi hat that will delineate each section of that song. And so that's that that having that mindset helps you go from being bored by the experience to being a little bit more involved and listening. And, you know, I, and, and that's, that's what I like. I like sort of finding the challenge in that, mm. you know, and, and let's say, you know, when I was doing the cat empire tour, I mean, all of those songs were challenging to me because, you know, you'll be playing some kind of soca rhythm and then in the next section, we'll go to a songo and then it'll go to a funky thing, you know? So my challenge was not only being able to nail all those individual grooves, but then making sure that when I transition from one to the other, you know, those transitions are smooth and, and, and all of that stuff. So, um, you know, th that's just, that's just my attitude of, you know, putting, putting the music ahead of everything. It's not, you know, I, I, I can't wait to get to this bar because, you know, that's when I get to play my flashy fill. And so, you know, all the time leading up to the flashy fill is just, you know, you're just time wasting because you want to get to this point where you can go um, ballistic. You know what I mean? <laughs> so time that's wasting. I that's a good use of words too, time <laughs> yeah. wasting. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I, I um, you know, that's my advice to people. It's just put the music first. If you, if you love what you you do and you want to do it for a long time if you put the music first it will guarantee that i mean steve gad is steve gad's 78 wow and he's he's as busy now as he has always been like he's probably not doing as many studio things but he's been on the road with james taylor for ages and mm -hmm. when he's not doing that he's doing other things you know and that's what i want that's the career that's the career that i want mm. That's that's so true, man. And when you you kind of take a step back and look at these guys who are successful, and you and you see them play and you watch them play, you can tell that they're in it. You know that they they are just so invested in in what they're playing and what they're doing, because you can also tell the guys that aren't. <laughs> like you know, if you see a, a a musician who's not genuine and and not like and they're not playing from the heart and they're just like either going through the motions or yeah, thinking about you know something else then then yeah it, that comes across you know to the audience so it, yeah. it's no no surprise that the guys who are still playing you know later in their lives and are at a super high level are the ones who are the most invested so yeah yeah well you know that sort of you know, I'll, I'll, you know that, that leads me to other things that you know part of our job and I, I i can guarantee you know what i'm talking about here ben but sometimes you might be playing a song that you hate or that bores the pants off you, but you have to make it sound like you love it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that, and that's the important thing. You know, sometimes we have to, you know, fake it so that For we're sure. not coming across as, you know, man, this drum, I can tell this drum is really boring. You know, I, I want to be, regardless of whether I like a song or not, I'd like to um, be seen as someone who's looks like, man, this, this guy's really getting into it. You know, he's really enjoying it, you know? Yeah. For that, sure, that's, for sure. That's important. Oh man, it's so important, and it, and it kind of brings up that discussion as well of like you know, um, at some point when you're on a gig and maybe you don't love it so much, and you know it's not your most favorite type of music or people or whatever. Like it, it is our job, you know. Like not that we're selling out to for for a paycheck or whatever, but you know we are using our skills to do a job and give the audience, you know, uh, hopefully a a certain feeling or emotion, um, you know, and, and we're kind of part of that, even if we're not personally like, you know, yeah, uh, emotionally all in love with, with, with it. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting topic too. <laughs> well, well, Carl, Carl Law said something to me once. Um, and I, I, I remember we were actually in the band room at, at Ronnie Scott's and he said that, you know, when you when you're doing a gig, you know, like we we're about to do at Ronnie Scott's, there are a lot of people in this room that have just had a shitty week, a hard week at work, and all they want is just to spend some money that they've earned to go out and have a drink and listen to some music. So, you know, if you keep that in the back of your mind, mm. do you have an obligation? You know, mm -hmm. there are mm -hmm. paying, there are people paying to uh, 
kind of forget about some crappy experiences they may have they may have had a bad day or they may have found out that they've lost their job oh it could be any number of things and and you know they're they're looking to us like we would look to going to see a movie for a bit of escapism they're looking to us for a bit of escapism for two hours or an hour and a half of escapism from what it is that they had to deal with that day Mm. that's important that's important to me that's so important and uh, and like you know again looking at, at your career and, and how successful you've been like you're 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 living proof and you're doing it every day where you're like like i said playing at such a high level and delivering um anything i hear you play is is good you know <laughs> which i think like that doesn't come that that's that's certainly not the case for everyone but every time i hear a recording or you know something you've posted or whatever it's like yeah it's it's always the highest quality and um and yeah, like I said in the beginning, super inspiring. And um, yeah, um, I'm so happy we got to talk today and, and <laughs> uh, you know, chat about some of this stuff. And, and uh, you know, um, we could talk for, for hours, I'm sure, <laughs> with the oh, we different could, topics and things yes. like that. But, uh, but yeah, man, this has been so, so fun. So I really appreciate you sitting down and talking with me today and, and all the people that are going to hear this, hopefully, and, and get something out of it as well. Um, so, man, yeah. Thank you again. Thank I hope you so, we can thank catch you up so again. much for asking me, mate. Of course. Of course, man. Of course. We'll catch up again soon. That'd be great. Okay. <laughs> See you, mate. See ya.